Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. A lot of people have been watching the Ottawa trucking protest and wondering, why aren't they sending in the riot cops? You know, guys with shields and clubs and tear gas to sweep away the protest, arrest a whole bunch of people and clear the streets. The practical answer is that they probably can't. And what I mean by this is that there are real serious tactical considerations that make this a very difficult scenario for police. In order to understand why, we need to sort of first consider a little bit about modern police counter-protest doctrine. And that is that you don't want to be seen to be using brutal or extreme force against protesters. The reason for that is that when you brutalize protesters, it actually tends to drive a lot of sympathy to those protesters and against the police. So if you think of old photographs where they're menacing protesters with dogs, that ultimately is a counterproductive strategy. It tends to, in fact, uh, support the ideals of the protesters, whatever those ideals are. So these tactical considerations apply regardless of who the protesters are. It's just issues of how you deal with large groups of angry people. So this is, you know, the first thing is that we really have to take all of that sort of obviously brutal force off the table. They're not going to come out with, you know, live ammunition or dogs or anything like that. And that really limits the police in terms of their tactics. However, police forces have gotten very good at dealing with this. And they do so in ways that allow them to apply a lot of force, very heavy, very serious force to people in ways that don't look like they're doing it. And so they don't have the bad optics. So instead of using live ammunition, we see more rubber bullets and beanbag rounds and those kinds of things. And there's real heavy uses of things like tear gas and pepper spray, which are actually pretty serious. I mean, if you think about what it's like being pepper sprayed, it's real bad. And what it's like being tear gas. These are really unpleasant, heavy uses of force when you actually consider what the experience is for the, the person receiving it. But optically, they don't look that bad. Tear gas sort of looks like a pleasant white mist. And then the protesters just start breaking down into sort of, you know, teary, ragged messes that kind of look a little pathetic. Ultimately, the optics of that are that the police didn't really do that much. They just kind of sprayed this mist out and then the protest starts, you know, dissipating and everybody looks like kind of whiny, crying babies. So this is why tear gas is really favored as a tactic. Similarly, pepper spray just kind of looks like you're spraying somebody down with nothing all that serious. Because you're not actually, you know, if you're sitting at home watching this on TV, you don't feel the burning. You don't feel the agony of that. Uh, things like beanbag and baton rounds and so forth, these uh, less than lethal munitions, also have this advantage. Because even when people are very seriously injured by these, because they're being hit by a projectile fired out of something that, at least here in Canada, would legally qualify as a firearm, so you're quite literally shooting at people, if somebody is badly injured, you can say, oh, well, you know, these are less than lethal rounds. This is just a, a tragic accident. We shot this guy in the face and it really messed him up for the rest of his life. But this is a tragic accident resulting from, you know, a an oopsie with these less than lethal munitions. And therefore it's, you know, it, it doesn't have the same terrible optics as if you just pull your handgun and shoot somebody in the face. Different kind of, uh, different kind of experience for the viewing public at home. So this is a very, very important consideration. And as I said, police have gotten very good at dealing with these, with protests using these kinds of tactics. They have all sorts of pre-planned and practiced methods that they use for this. You know, when you hear terms like kettling and so forth, these are pre-planned tactics that they can break out in order to deal with things. However, these tactics rely on certain assumptions which is basically that these protests are going to be acting in ways that are somewhat similar to previous protests, to things that they have dealt with in the past, which is usually large groups of pedestrians kind of tightly packed together and shouting and so forth. 
This one is a very different kind of protest, and it's messing with a lot of the underlying tactical assumptions. The first problem is that it's very spread out because of these vehicles. And that creates a real issue because if you want to start deploying, well, if you want to start deploying tear gas, it's a lot less effective in terms of the number of people you're going to hit per canister that you use. So instead of getting hundreds of people with a single canister of tear gas, you're getting maybe tens. And they're also doing this in areas that have residential buildings, including residential apartment buildings. That poses an additional problem if you want to start using gases or chemical agents, because if you're gassing tens of protesters, but hundreds of residents, now you're really turning the locals against you. The locals are very upset and angry and frustrated by hearing horn noises, but if they start getting tear gassed in their homes, they will they may change their mind as to who the villains are especially because you need to consider that tear gas is potentially dangerous. Tear gas doesn't tend to kill many protesters because, as a general rule, going out to a protest and shouting your anger is kind of a healthy person's game, at least to a certain level. If you've got something like, you know, end-stage COPD, you're probably staying home. And so if you're getting tear gassed in your home, you are a, a lot more likely to suffer real nasty consequences. The optics for the police look way worse if it starts being, hey, you remember everybody's, you know, this darling old grandpa? Well, turns out he choked to death because of tear gas coming through his vents and he just didn't have the lung capacity to deal with it. The optics on that are real ugly, and so this really limits that as a potential tactic here. When you start thinking about things like going through with, you know, kettling, as I said, you know, a shield wall and people with clubs and so forth, it's much more difficult in this scenario because you've got these obstacles. These big rigs themselves are a physical impediment that prevents, you know, they've got to work around that, which is difficult if you're trying to form, say, a shield wall. And you also need to consider the possibility of these big rigs being deployed as weapons if they start cracking down and sort of angrying up the crowd. Uh, typically, you know, most protests start out as being fairly peaceful and so forth, and they get angrier when they face police confrontations. So this is going to be a big consideration. You know, what happens if we form up a shield wall to start arresting people and somebody decides to drive a big rig through it? The police are not going to want to run the risk of that happening. And so I think that they're going to have to be a little more restrained in their tactics because of that. So that is another consideration here is just that the tactics normally used here, you know, don't really work when you start dealing with big vehicles like this. They can't just easily go in there. I've seen some suggestions that the police could go like vehicle to vehicle and start issuing tickets. And, you know, I, somebody was saying that they could go and spray the inside of vehicles with pepper spray. That's just not going to happen. The police aren't going to send small groups of uniformed police officers into the crowd to start making people angry such that they would be surrounded by an angry mob. No, they're they're not going to risk officers like that. Other tactics that are often used involve uh, undercovers planted in the crowd. And that works a lot less well when you start talking about a line of big rigs because they, they probably have a whole bunch of trained undercover officers who would love to go out and pretend to be, you know, a protester so that they can either uh, execute snatch and grab maneuvers or perhaps act as provocateurs. But... I don't think, I suspect that the police just don't have a ready stock of undercover big rigs. And I also suspect that they probably don't have a whole lot of officers who are trained to operate a big rig, even if they had the vehicle handy. So it's very difficult for the police to just kind of insert somebody in a way that will blend in with this crowd. It's a very challenging situation in that, uh, in that sense. So these are really big uh, problems that they have. There are also big problems in terms of the public relations aspect. The police always want to be the ones acting second. They want to be the ones 
who are responding to things rather than the ones who appear to be instigating. And so when you've got a protest where people are smashing windows and setting fire to cars and so forth, that makes it a lot easier for the police to go in and justify the use of force. We had to go in and start hitting people with clubs because they're, look at the businesses they're destroying, look at the cars they're setting on fire, this kind of thing. And so often again, they'll have, you know, provocateurs or, so, you know, so forth. They'll try to provoke a crowd. And, you know, if you've ever dealt with anybody who has been active in a protest community, they'll talk about this concern about, you know, the crowd getting provoked in these fashions. But right now this crowd is being sort of un uh, annoyingly for the police, at least, uh, non-destructive. We don't have a whole lot of video of people smashing windows. We don't have burning cars. We don't have, you know, trash cans on fire or people throwing things at the police lines or anything like that. And that makes it a lot more difficult for the police to justify their use of force in a way that doesn't make them seem like the bullies once they actually go in and start uh, trying to do something along, you know, trying to actually use force. So, this is really messing with standard police doctrine. This is a bit of a novel tactic and one that uh, that creates problems. If you think about somebody who is going in to take something apart and they've got a, a hammer to pull nails and they've got a screwdriver to undo screws, if you've never actually heard of a bolt, you'd have a really bad day if you if those were the tools you had. That's the issue the police are dealing with here is that they just don't really have the tools for this unique circumstance. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be powerless. Right now, they are working on the tools. And in fact, I don't think that this tactic will ever be as successful again as it has been in this particular scenario. The police have already started setting up barricades to prevent further trucks from arriving and to try to break up the line and so forth. That's one new tactic that we're seeing here that's being, uh, that's coming up as it goes. Another tactic that we see them trying is resource starvation, both in terms of shutting down the GoFundMe and the Ottawa mayor has admitted that this is a step that was taken by uh, the city of Ottawa, as well as the police force in Ottawa, which raises some charter concerns on that. But also now they've decided to adopt a tactic of potentially arresting anybody looking to bring fuel or other resources like food, that kind of thing, to the protest. And the basis on which they're doing this is they're essentially saying that the protesters are engaged in the criminal offense of mischief by preventing people from accessing a public space. And thus, by bringing them fuel, you would be aiding and abetting, uh, you'd become a party to that mischief and therefore subject to arrest. It's a lot easier to arrest that single person who's off, you know, hauling a cart of fuel than it is to arrest, you know, the whole line of trucks. So this is an interesting tactic that's now being tried. And whenever you've got a protest, there's always this uh, arms race between the police and the protesters in terms of tactics and responses and so forth. So I'm not sure where this is ultimately going to go. I find all of this kind of fascinating because uh, I'm not really a big military tactics kind of guy. There's lots of people out there who could talk your ear off about all sorts of military tactical stuff. And I am, I'm not as up on that, but I am kind of, I've always been kind of curious about this sort of protest and counter protest tactical struggle because it's really interesting and the rules are are kind of unusual military tactics is just you want to kill the other side problem solved protest tactics are kind of an elaborate pageantry about who can get the best pr and typically protests win not because they achieve their goals that people say oh well we're going to give up and we'll give you everything you want they win because they sway public opinion in some fashion. And that's really what's at stake here. Anyway, as I said, this is a really fascinating uh, situation here. And 
The other thing I, I will note is that we will likely see some delayed responses because eventually people are going to go home. Like this protest isn't going to last forever. Uh, in 2028, the truckers aren't still going to be circling Ottawa. So people are going to go home. And once they're separate from the group, once they're on their own, they become a lot more vulnerable. The police will often arrest people uh, as they leave protests and they'll often arrest people sometime later down the road. So we, I would be quite shocked if the police weren't taking down a list of protest participants that they felt they wanted to go after later and IDing people from, you know, pictures and so forth and planning to address some of these things later down the road. Now, people who whose participation in the protest was limited to expression are probably pretty safe in this sense. But people who have engaged in criminal activities in the course of this, uh, the you know, just because the police aren't grabbing them right now doesn't mean that they won't. And the police basically have unlimited time. There really isn't a functional statute of limitations for criminal uh, charges here in Canada. I for almost as a complete blanket statement, I'd say that there, I know that technically there are statutes of limitations that apply to some things, but it really doesn't work. It breaks down in practice. So essentially the police can go after this whenever they feel like it, a year away, 10 years away, 20, whatever it, you know, whatever they feel like. So I would expect to see after the protest breaks up that they'll probably lay some charges. Some people may have their firearms licenses at risk because there have been reports of people showing firearms or that sort of thing. As I mentioned in a previous video, don't bring guns to a protest. It's not legal here in Canada and will just cause you cause you grief. So yeah, um, that's kind of a, a little tactical assessment here as to what's going on. And we'll see what happens. Uh, I... I'm kind of curious just from an intellectual puzzle kind of way as to sort of the the interplay of these things. But uh, yeah, let me know in the comments below uh, what you think of all this. I'm also going to link the Twitter thread. I originally posted all of this to Twitter, and so I'm going to link that uh, thread here. Um, I might, some things I've elaborated on in this video, some things I might have said better in the Twitter thread, so check it out. Anyway, thank you for watching. Please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Subscribe to see more content. Uh, I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Jonathan Wheeler, Canada's National Firearms Association, Mike, Kyle Martin, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited and Mark Olivier Demour. And at the $20 level, Peter Hilger, Mark Whittington, Jane Babe and Luxor, Haywire, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Aaron Delso. Thank you as well to all of the $10 supporters who are in the crawl immediately following, as well as the uh, sort of five and five split. So thank you guys. Um, yeah, it's this is really an interesting situation here. And I'm, I'm kind of fascinated just in terms of the... Uh, the sort of tactical elements of it. A lot of people have been ascribing this as like, oh, the police really, you know, they must really like these protesters. I don't think that's what's going on because fundamentally the police tend to have an opposition to protest as a general category. The police tend to be agents of the status quo and they really don't like people defying their authority or sort of outside of their authority. So that... I don't really ascribe much to that notion that the police are, you know, okay with this protest. Maybe some individual officers are, but as an institution, I don't think so. Yeah, it's, uh, and ultimately we're going to see both sides learning from this in terms of both police and protest groups. And when I say protest groups, I don't mean just these guys here. I mean, every sort of protest group is going to be taking notes and trying to consider how they can make their protests more effective in future. So you may see some of these tactical elements being deployed in future at, uh, you know, indigenous uh, land or water rights protests, for example. Uh, 
all sorts of possibilities. Anyway, let me know again your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge. Thank you.